and welcome to Shaka Extra Time. I'm Paul Ndiho. Joining me on set is Shaka Sal himself, a.k.a. The Kabbalah Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? Usually terrific. A warm welcome to you all. Our Facebook followers are watching us live. Shaka Extra Time is a show that comes to you every Tuesday. And uh, we talk about uh, all sorts of issues. And today we are going to be uh, talking about uh, uh, the tension between Uganda and Rwanda. So welcome all your comments uh, later on in the show. Uh, let's uh, begin uh, uh, by going to a comment, Shaka, here from uh, Wako. Why is Uganda and Rwanda not at peace at the border? Well, obviously, because uh, the two uh, individual rulers of those two countries uh, i guess uh, each of them feels like uh, you know uh, like a big fish in a, a small pond uh what what could be causing this tension i think first of all really you're talking about uh, countries that are led by uh, essentially governments that do not uh, at least according to all the data i have seen that do not reflect uh, what you would call uh, social, economic, political justice for their people. You're talking about individuals who are essentially too, too powerful. Uh, individuals, frankly, that uh, need a system, um, at least that reflects some kind of checks and balances. And in the absence of that, uh, I am reminded of uh, a former French uh, ruler, king, as a matter of fact, I think it was King Louis VIII who said uh, he was simply too much and he had been intoxicated with the power to the extent that he said, you know what, I am the state and the state is me. Let us say Interesting. Uh, 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 in how French. about, uh, uh, for example, to, earlier today, the Rwandan uh, foreign minister, uh, Mr. Richard, uh, says, well, I was uh, saying that uh, uh, Uganda is harboring uh, some uh, rebels uh, opposed to Kagame's uh, regime. Uh, they are blocking uh, goods and services uh, from going to Uganda. And uh, the foreign minister in Uganda, uh, Mr. Sam Kutesa, responded uh, uh, and said that uh, all those uh, allegations uh, are not true. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, uh, you have to wonder whether, in fact, uh, you're talking about uh, incontrovertible evidence here. I mean, if the minister of uh, Rwanda, you're talking about uh, Dr. Richard Sesvera? Correct. The minister of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs, a man who grew up, as a matter of fact, uh, in Namtamba. The last time when he used to be Rwanda's ambassador to the United States, uh, mm. living in this capital here, yeah. I used to refer to him as uh, someone that came from uh, the Namutamba Institute of uh, Diplomacy. <laughs> 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 very, very diplomatic. Mm -hmm. Very nice guy, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I miss him being here, though. Yeah, he obviously has mm -hmm. to say something, and probably, who knows, uh, maybe, in fact, what he is saying has some kind of legs, but we don't see those legs yet. He has to provide us with those types of legs so that whatever he's saying at least can be seen to be walking. On the other hand, when you talk about uh, the Ugandan foreign minister, Sam Kutesa, Kahamba Kutesa, uh, he's doing his job. Uh, maybe because there is no obvious evidence or whatever, but I think um, it is his duty, for example, uh, to deny that there is anything just like what, in fact, uh, is being alleged mm. by Dr. Sezvera. Uh, Shaka, uh, let's not beat about uh, the bush here. Some uh, critics have said that uh, this is not the first time uh, these uh, two countries are going at, uh, at it. Uh, uh, they fought before, for example, they fought in uh, Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in 90. Uh, nine and in 2000, and a lot of people uh, died in Ixangani. In Ixangani. A lot of people died. I As a matter of fact, the International Criminal was it not the International Criminal Court, it is the International uh, Court, Court of Arbitrary of, of Justice. Yes, yes, it actually weighed in, and Uganda owes at least 10 billion dollars. US billion dollars to the Democratic Republic of Congo, which it has never paid. So I remember uh, covering the, one of those uh, conflicts. I was one of the reporters who actually reported on the clashes uh, between uh, the, the two countries. 
Uh, it's something that was sparked off by just, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, poor poor management of soldiers. There were errant soldiers uh, uh, who started this whole thing, and a lot of uh, people died. But going f fast forwarding to today, we see a similar situation that people are coming up with these reckless statements, saying, accusing each other. This could potentially lead to another clash. Yeah, because first of all, let's face it, what has changed, in fact, since then? Nothing much has changed. You still have those two principles in place. In Chigari, you have uh, uh, Major General Paul Kagame, retired by Saturday, you know, tired. In Entebbe State House, you have uh, General Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, retired, but certainly, of course, as you know, not tired. And you have these two individuals with very huge egos. Again, like I said a little bit earlier, they are at a disadvantage in the sense that uh, they do not have government systems which reflect checks and balances in terms of how they exercise their power. So really, it's like they have no boundaries, no borders in terms of what they, they can actually decide to do to one another. Uh, if I had you collected, you talked about egos. Is it about egos or it's about national interests here? Well, it depends. Ben. First of all, we're talking about uh, decisions that are being made by these very powerful individuals. We are talking about egos, obviously. And uh, we are also talking about uh, perhaps uh, being a little bit reckless. Because let's face it, each of them is supposed to be looking after millions of human beings. Uh, and again, uh, when you think about it, uh, you look at the Rwandans and the Ugandans, they are really like brothers and sisters. They go way back, you know, uh, to those good times, for example. Mm. I mean, these two individuals, for example, at one time, they belonged to the same rebel group mm -hmm. in Uganda. They are comrades. They were supposed to be comrades, and they were. Uh, Kagame was uh, in... Uh, the National Resistance uh, Army, which was led by uh, Yoweri Museveni, which seized the power uh, in 1986. And then after that, uh, Kagame worked in uh, the Ugandan government. Uh, he was actually uh, a sort of uh, middle level uh, intelligence officer in the NRA. And eventually, uh, you know, the Rwandan component of the NRA uh, essentially went to fight for mm. their way back, their right to go back to the land of their ancestors, Rwanda, in 1990. Uh, how would you respond to uh, Nambiliru Mona Amina? Uh, yes, I would think both leaders are egoistic uh, in nature, at the expense of the people. Uh, that led us. What cannot be settled or amicably is applying social and economic justice for all in terms of those two countries? I know that uh, there are a lot of people in those two countries who don't want to hear this uh, operative word, which is really, again, democracy. What is needed in the, each of those countries is democracy. But wait a minute, what we are talking about is not democracy. Those, these are two borders, uh, two countries that are gone beyond a democracy here. You see, if there was a democracy in each of these countries, it would be difficult for the individual rulers, really, to make these types of reckless decisions, decisions that put uh, in harm's way their people. And these are two individuals, by the way, when you think about it, Paul, who constantly talk about their belief in what they call Pan-Africanism. Or the vision thing. The vision thing. They talk about regional integration. And in fact, they are both members of the East African community, which is supposed to essentially uh, bring about uh, a region, bring about uh, laws and rules and regulations, which help each of them to harness their potential and their resources and what have you, for the benefit of their people. But here we are, we're talking about, in fact, some of these countries spend probably a lot of money actually buying bullets, buying tanks, APCs, AK-47s, to do what? To kill each other.
Well, one could argue that that's in the uh, it's in their national interest uh, to protect their own citizens. Who's the national interest? Uh, both um, seven could argue the same, and Kagame is entitled to arguing the same way because they have the right to protect their own people. I think, but I think what is not deniable is that uh, these two leaders do not get along, you know, with each other really. I think that. Um, First of all, to tell you the truth, I remember back uh, in 1999, uh, I remember sitting in uh, the Rwandan capital, Chigali, in the officer's mess, where you could sit on white leather chairs. We were three people. It was then uh, uh, Vice President uh, and Defense Minister, Major General Paul Kagame. I remember he actually came driving himself in a black Mercedes Benz. And there was the late uh, Colonel uh, Patrick uh, Karijaya, who was the chief of uh, external intelligence. Now deceased. Now deceased, uh, who was, of course, uh, uh, really, by all the facts that we have seen, all the evidence, was actually assassinated, really, or murdered, whatever you want, uh, in the Michelangelo Hotel in Johannesburg. Uh, the, the two were talking about, for example, how their Ugandan brothers and the senior brothers, they referred to them, pretty much treated them like kids. They were treated like kids, uh, as if, in fact, they were supposed to be subordinate to them. And it was very interesting because it reminded me of uh, a friend of mine, a Ugandan journalist by the name Haruna Kanavi who at one time used to edit the Shariat newsletter, I'm sure you remember it. And in fact, at one time, he wrote a very interesting piece saying that uh, the authorities in Rwanda were actually subordinate to those in Uganda, to the extent that he actually said that the Rwandese Patriotic Army, for example, the RPA, was like uh, essentially RPF. an extension. The PF was the front, okay. but the army, the armored wing was RPA. He said that uh, they were basically like an extension of Uganda to the extent that they were like a region of Uganda, a district. And for that, he was actually arrested and detained in Rosita for several months. But those are some of the reckless statements that ended up leading to the first Kisangani war between Uganda and Rwanda. The reason I'm saying that is because when I was in that uh, Kiyovu officer's mess, in the Rwandan capital, Chigari, I was actually being told by then uh, Vice President and Defense Minister Paul Kagame about that, that they felt that uh, they somehow their sovereignty was not being respected. And this is, by the way, when I was there, it was after the first round of the two countries fighting, and guess what? Mm. As you said earlier, on foreign territory. Democratic Republic of Congo. But then again, you see, they also thought that they had the right probably to do that actually in that country, because if you remember, those two countries also came together in terms of fighting in that country and toppling Mobutu Seseseko, Wazabanga, and installing Rora Desire Kabira who there are a lot of indications that uh, they may, in fact, have been, uh, in a sense, responsible for probably his exit. Mm. Shaka, uh, you come from uh, a border town, right, uh, the, uh, the, the hot spot right now. Uh, that's uh, your hometown, correct? I come from Kavali. I've already said I'm a Kavali kid, yeah. Okay, so what's at stake? Uh, why would it be in the interest of Kagame uh, to close, to shut the border, uh, to stop vehicles coming in from Uganda. Uh, people depend on border trade, cross-border trade. Uh, it's always, in some areas, it's a porous border. People cross over. You have kids going to school in Uganda. You have kids going to school in Rwanda, and vice versa. So there is so much going on. Why would it be in the interest of an individual ruler to shut down the, uh, the border? I think that uh, from his vantage point, uh, there must be what he considers to be a compelling reason. Because let's face it, in fact, when you look at uh, the steps that he has taken, you would probably, you know, say this is a man who is about to commit 
political suicide. I'm saying that because, let's face it, uh, uh, when you talk about uh, Rwanda closing the border, Rwanda is, just like Uganda, is very much landlocked to the extent that it receives, for example, its imports, which come through Mombasa or Dar es Salaam, it has to receive them through Uganda, or it has to receive them through Burundi. Mm. And you know the relationship between Uganda and Burundi and Rwanda is not good. And mm. then he has a problem also with the neighboring Democratic Republic of mm. Congo to a certain degree. Then Tanzania also, that kind of stuff. So it seems to me that uh, he's virtually, um, you know, he has virtually, in fact, essentially uh, helped his adversaries to surrounding him so that he has actually isolated himself from the rest of the region. Uh, this is uh, a Facebook comment uh, from uh, Serex uh, Rain, who agrees with you. He says, which neighbor? Burundi, Rwanda is at uh, loggerheads with uh, Burundi, Tanzania, and Congo. Maybe uh, if these two uh, leopards can fight each other, maybe they can sort themselves out. You know, there are some Rwandans who believe that uh, when they look at themselves, especially the Tutsi community, they sort of somehow uh, feel that uh, they are like Israel, the Israelis who are able to survive in the Middle East, surrounded by people that are not so friendly. Uh, so sometimes Rwanda thinks that uh, it has the military capacity, for example, uh, to figure out its own way in that particular region. I don't really think that uh, there is sufficient evidence to uh, agree with that kind of uh, way of looking at things. But I think that at the end of the day, the way forward sincerely is for the two countries to have negotiations, really. In fact, not only with the two countries, Kagame has also to figure out a way of living together with a neighbor called Pierre Nkurunziza, the president of Burundi, whether he likes it or not. Because let's face it, how long can he, in fact, be able uh, to somehow isolate himself politically and still expect to survive? Because, let's face it, he will, have, he will need, for example, to export, uh, you know, his goods and what have you outside of Rwanda. He will need Export to, coltan, well, which they don't produce. Rwanda does way. not produce coltan. But they're the biggest exporters. I don't know whether it's, that still is the case, but uh, it yeah. used to be the case. In fact, there were times, even in terms of diamonds. Correct. And the last time I checked, Rwanda does not have diamonds, neither is, in fact, Uganda, but they used to be some of those top countries for exporting some of those resources. Mm. He will need, in, in other words, really, he needs to be part of that region. He needs to uh, be able to get along with his brothers and sisters and what have you. It's not only in the interest of him as an individual, but in fact, it is for the benefit of his people and the people in the region. But I think that uh, there must be, again, a compelling reason. There have been reports, for example, that uh, uh, there is uh, a Rwandan armed group. In fact, I think uh, the Rwandan foreign minister... Right. right. Was I was actually alleging... going to go to a comment of, uh, just in relation to that. Uh, uh, going back to the, some of the points uh, that uh, you made uh, earlier, talking about uh, uh, Uganda supporting RNC, the one the that Rwanda is... The Rwandan National Congress. Yes, the one is, uh, that is supposedly uh, run and uh, owned by... Uh, the not, not owned, I mean... Oh, okay, run led. by, led by uh, the former general, uh, Kayumba Nyamasa, well, lieutenant he's general. A, was a general, or is a general? Correct, yeah. General but at Kayumba the same Nyamasa, time... General who obviously at one time uh, used to be the one defense chief of staff. Yeah. At the same time, Uganda has also accused Rwanda of infiltrating its uh, intelligence apparatus. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the, that led also to the firing of the former uh, Ugandan uh, police uh, inspector general, Kele Kihura, uh, as a result of uh, him uh, opening doors for one intelligence guys uh, to come into Uganda and kidnap 
Rwandese who are taken back to, to that country. So how do you balance uh, the two? Each country is accusing the other of doing some sinister stuff in their respective countries. You have a point, obviously, uh, because uh, it's not only, in fact, beginning with uh, General Kari Kaihura, but uh, Rwanda had actually been in control of the Ugandan intelligence for a very, very, very long time. They had the ability, they had the capability of monitoring whatever was going on in the country of the Republic of Uganda, which Uganda, the kind of luxury that Uganda did not have. But then again, you also have to go back, by the way, to the neighbor after the Ugandan elections of 2000 and uh, one? Uh, 2001, mm -hmm. you had this group called PRA which was supposedly uh, training in Rwanda. And yeah, there are people who talk about how it was a phantom, how it did not exist and what have you. But there is a lot of comparing evidence, for example. In fact, incontrovertible, because there are two very important names that come to mind that you and I know about. There, are, there were two lieutenant colonels. Mm. One was Anthony Chakavari. Anthony Chakavari who had to be, who used to be, of course, part of the uh, uh, National Resistance Army and eventually Uganda People of the Defense Forces. Mm. There was also another lieutenant colonel called uh, Samson Mande. Mm. These two individuals at one time, they found their way in Sweden, in the Scandinavian countries, in Sweden. And the reason they end up there is precisely because they were supposedly leading PRA operating in Rwanda. So there were actually negotiations which involved Rwanda, Uganda, and the international community to the extent that these two gentlemen end up in fact in Sweden, except that the last time I checked, one of them is back in Uganda. So, so could Uganda be using that uh, scenario that you just painted, maybe it also to support a, a rebel group uh, to, to overthrow uh, Kagame in Rwanda? Well, first of all, uh, their allegation is that uh, Kagame was working with some elements to essentially effect change in neighboring Uganda, and perhaps, in fact, uh, uh, being part of a group that would have liked to not only change in terms of uh, a different government, but also change at the top, somebody to replace the current Ugandan, you know, head of state, Yoweri Museveni. I don't think that uh, he's amused by that himself. So um, I think when you think about uh, the history, you talked about uh, how those two countries have already fought, not once, but twice. Mind you, during that fighting, there is incontrovertible evidence also uh, to show that there were so many people who lost their lives, who died on both sides, mm -hmm. but that on the Ugandan side it was even more. I was actually even told by Lieutenant Colonel Samson Mandy, who happened to be the commander at the time of the Phantom RP and stuff like that later. Uh, he says that um, they were, you know, what you would call huge mass graves in the eastern DRC, mm. where a lot of these Ugandans were actually buried. Interesting. And so there are people who have said that Yoweri uh, Museven is not the kind of person that uh, will forget that very easily. Uh, in fact, they have even used the word uh, that is a uh, Nyankori Ruchiga word. Uh, calling Enzigo, with something to say with somebody that uh, cannot really forget uh, what, you know, harm you have caused him and all that kind of stuff, mm. and probably thinks about getting an opportunity uh, to essentially make you pay back. Mm. But how about people who said that uh, these two countries, uh, or these two leaders, uh, President Yorim Seven and President uh, Paul Kagame, are great friends. Uh, you, we've seen videos of them uh, at family events, uh, going visiting each other's farm. Uh, they've known each other from the time they were young boys. These guys have grown really to like each other. How do you uh, 
uh, how do you put that in context? Those are optics. They call them optics, pictures. And Kagame looks up look to President Tim Seven as elder brother. Well, there's no question that um, at one point uh, uh, Kagame would probably have looked at uh, Museveni as a big brother, as a mentor, and all that kind of stuff. But some of the people who claim to know about these people much better than I do have told me, for example, that uh, Yoweri Museveni used to feel more comfortable with a general Rwijema. Who was killed uh, in 1990. Yes. He was initially, uh, he was originally he was the commander of the initial Rwandan patriotic army offensive mm. to Rwanda. One of the first casualties of uh, the war. That is correct. As a matter of fact, from what I have seen, he seems to have died uh, two days after they had crossed into Rwanda. That, that was the kind of person, frankly, that uh, Museveni felt very comfortable with, uh, that uh, he could have very easily done business with him. And as a matter of fact, there even a lot of Rwandans who say that Rwijema was so good that if Rwijema was actually the guy who is in charge of Rwanda today, that we wouldn't be seeing, you know, or talking about what we are talking about today. That one, I don't know. Now, Kagame, uh, obviously, yeah, he has good reason to look at Museveni um, as his uh, big brother also because, again, like we said, they used to be together in the same outfit, mm. the NRA. But the relationship, frankly, was uh, about master, servant, so to speak, because you had a president, uh, Museveni, as president, mm. commander in the chief of the armed forces and what have you. Kagame was a major mm. in that army, working in intelligence and all that kind of stuff. But now they share the same rank. That is true. Yeah. They now share the same rank. Uh, they should be able to have mutual respect. But right now, it looks like that mutual respect now has probably turned into a sort of mutual distrust. Uh, what are you talking about at tomorrow in Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow in Straight Talk Africa, we are going to be looking at... Uh, Women's Day. We're going to look at uh, women and see whether or not uh, so far they have really been making some progress. There are people who say they have actually made remarkable progress. And so we'll be having women talking about what, where they are coming from, where they are, and where they are heading. Uh, we have less than a minute. Uh, what can Rwandans and Ugandans do at this point? You know, I remember I was born in a family where my father was a church warden. Uh, so there are times when they would say that uh, if you are in a situation like that, if you, you find that yourself in, in a situation like that, what you have to do really is to get saved if you are religious. In this particular case, sincerely. And I'm saying this from the deepest, better part of the bottom of my Kavale heart and soul, which is almost like a border town of Rwanda and Uganda. The two principles need to reach out to each other. They need to talk and figure out how to accept the fact that they may not actually be friends, but they are condemned to living together. And therefore, they should respect the fact that they occupy those areas, and not only as individuals, but really they have to think about the people that they lead. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I thank you so much. I look forward to hosting you on another edition of Vashaka Extra Time. Until then, so long from Washington. Thank you. Bye.